Hi, everyone. I'm Doug DeVos, and uh, I, I think you're going to really enjoy the conversation we just had with uh, recently with Vivek Ramaswamy, who uh, you may know is running for president, but there's so much more uh, to him and his story uh, and, and to what he believes in and how he's articulating it and how he is uh, you know, doing it himself, but really kind of challenging all of us uh, to think through uh, the things that are important to us and, and how we can really live up to the national motto of from many one uh, and, and find a way to come around a common cause, a common purpose, the things that bring us together no matter where we come from and, and what we look like. Uh, and so I, I think those are the things that uh, have always been important to me as I, as I think back to what I learned growing up with my father and Jay Van Andel in the Amway world. That's what it was all about. It was about a cause. It was about a purpose. It was about doing good things, and when you do good things, you can help others. Uh, and uh, we wanted to welcome everyone in on that journey. So I, I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I had a great time, and I uh, hope you will enjoy it too. We believe and have always believed in this country that man was created in the image of God, that he was given talents and responsibilities and was instructed to use them to make this world a better place in which to live. And you see, this is the really great thing of America. It's time to discover what binds us together, and finding it has the power to transform our world. That's what I believe. How about you? Vivek, thanks for taking some time to join us here on Believe. It's, uh, it's a tremendous honor. Really looking forward to this conversation uh, and having the time to, to dive into all the really interesting things that you've done and that you're currently doing right now. I appreciate it. It's good to be on, and it's good to take a breather and have a slightly longer-form conversation than a five at TV, too, so I enjoy this. Yeah. yeah that's right. Uh, you've done a lot of that lately, though, haven't you? I have, yeah. It's part of the reason I actually started a podcast in the campaign, it was something that was new, but it actually, it's a forcing function to spend like a half hour with a briefing with somebody. So I'm now doing that daily too, but the television hits, they scratch the surface. I like to go deeper. Let's do that here. You know, here in uh, Believe, but we try to explore and it's really a, uh, it is, it's kind of based off a book my dad wrote in the 1970s called Believe. And it really challenged us to believe in something. And, and, and that's what we want to spend time talking about here and, and understand and from you, the things you believe in. And, and, and I'd love to kind of just start. I, we, I know you're running for president. I know that's really important, but I want to take a step or two back and understand who you are uh, a little bit. I'd love to hear a little bit more on unpacking, you know, some of the decisions you've made. And as I read parts of your book, you know, when you're in high school, some of the things that, 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 that drove you, as you reflect on now, there's a, there's a story about your service, uh, when you're in high school trying to get into college that that uh, wasn't as genuine as as you look back now as you would have wanted it to be. Yep. Uh, and, and the things you experienced, uh, you know, at, as you were forming things, as you started right away in school with your entrepreneurial uh, side of things. So t talk us through that a little bit uh, to, to make sure we get to uh, a good grounding of who you are. Yeah, I appreciate that. We don't take that step back sometimes. You know, so so <laughs> I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio as a kid of immigrants. My parents came to this country, my dad in the late 1970s, my mom in the early 80s. They didn't have a lot of money, but they did have, and they came here to get an education. And I think that was, yeah. that was always the North Star for our family. And I think that informed a lot of the views that I have today. It was a faith-based, two-parent-in-the-household, traditional family with a focus sure. on education. And that was... In many ways, the ultimate privilege that allowed me to to get ahead. I went to a racially diverse public school through eighth grade. Uh, you know, I think the financial equation always tilted my parents away from private school. But when push came to shove for high school, you know, they decided they go into a school with a greater emphasis on academic achievement than the public school that I was in was you know, probably better for me. And I'm grateful for that decision sure. and the sacrifice they made for that. Went to Saint X High School, and then you know, as I kind of got out, one of the things I discovered about myself was I'm a contrarian. And so I ended up being okay. sort of the odd man out wherever I was. Uh, I, I was the lone Hindu kid in the Catholic high school. It was less that, but when I got to Harvard, I just found myself having different points of view than a lot of my classmates, even a lot of my professors. Not even necessarily on political topics, some of them were, but I ended up, I ended up, you know, embracing that outsider kind of contrarian mentality. I'd say I got a better education in college because of it than my peers. And, and then I got into the world of, I was studying molecular biology. I was sort of a, 
kind of a nerdy science guy, very scholastic all the way through college. I ended up getting a job at a hedge fund, though, in New York when I graduated that was doing biotech investing, which I actually found more stimulating at the time than just the hours spent slogging in the lab. And it was a really interesting time to get that job. It was, in the, it was the fall of 2007, right on the eve of the 08 crisis. And, you know, I wasn't apologetic about it. I, I, my parents came from an immigrant household, like I said, didn't come with a lot of money, scrappy upbringing. I was unapologetic about the fact that I wanted to live the American dream. I was going to school with kids who sure. had been from multi-generation families, yeah, you know, for the Upper East Side of Manhattan or elsewhere. And it was, it was interesting. I wouldn't have never, I would have never been exposed to that had I not gone to Harvard. I said, you know what? I, I'm interested in making my own way and living the dream through the system of American capitalism. And so, you know, this part of what I wrote in Woke, part of my regret is, uh, I don't say it's a regret, but reflection is that I do think that there's a loss of civic spirit in our country. And I think about rewinding the clock back to when I graduated from high school and graduated from college and thought about my mentality. It was really about, I'm doing this as an individual, the individualist, the, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm going to make my contribution through helping myself by making more money. I'm going to actually lift everybody else up. That was the, the 22 year old version of myself. And there was a lot of truth to it. But anyway, I got into biotech investing. Did that for seven years. About three years in, I had this itch to study law and political philosophy that I had never fully scratched. So lesson I learned was that you follow your passions, good things happen. I told my sure. bosses at the hedge fund in 2010, hey, it's been a great run. Really enjoyed it. Learned a lot. Thanks. I'm going to take three years and go to law school. I had a, had a spot at Yale at that time and said, you know, maybe I'll see you guys after and we'll see how it goes. They said, no, no, no. Keep your job. Manage a portfolio for yourself. And go to law school at the same time, if you will. I said, that's like a great deal. And so that wow. ended up being three of my most fruitful, successful years. And, you know, it actually got me even more autonomy on the job, actually, uh, you know, operating out of my home office, out of the apartment in New Haven. Sure. And, sure. Um, you know, a lot, a lot happened since I met my wife there, great years. And then after I came out and I really kind of had the foundation and the, and the guts to say, I'm actually going to start a biotech company of my own, challenging a lot of orthodoxies in big pharma. Doug, this is a long discussion for probably another day, how broken and well, yeah. dramatic big pharma is. But I ended up finding some opportunities to develop drugs that big pharma hadn't ignored. And that's really where I had my major success as an entrepreneur, right. built a multi-billion dollar business. And, you know, the rest there on tell and woke cake. Well, but you, you live the American dream and these ideas that you have. Uh, of what that looked like, and you and you joke a little bit about your 22 year old self that it maybe was a little bit more individualized, uh, you know, at that point. And, and again, I would say there's nothing wrong with that because your success does build and, and help others be successful as well. Uh, it's it's the old adage, right? You gotta uh, on the flight if you lose cabin pressure, you gotta get your own oxygen mask before you can help somebody else. You, you, you know, I, I I did all that. And, and and you have you you though saw something. I want I want to go back in there. We don't have to spend a lot of time in the biotech space or what you saw with Big Pharma, but you saw an opportunity, mm -hmm. and, and you found it, and you looked at an environment, and and saw something. Talk, can you talk about that a little bit? You know, yeah, some of the details. We don't need to go too fast, but or, or too deep. There's, it's an interesting thing of how we shape our beliefs, as I think about when you see opportunity and you grab it. Yeah, interesting. And what I would teach young people is, from my own lessons, the way you make it big, big time, not small time, big time in American capitalism, is you have to find an opportunity that others don't and be right about it. So you have to take a contrarian position. And right. it's easy enough to just be buck the trend, but you got to buck the trend and be right. So, so my business was built on... Mm -hmm an insight into the big pharma industry, which was that they behave like lemmings. And the reason they behave like lemmings is they're a regulated industry. It's a monopoly profit industry created by actually, you know, it's a government created monopoly industry created by the patent system. I'd say it's a bad thing. It's just what it is. But it's combined with being regulated by the FDA, that creates a culture of people who behave like government bureaucrats, even in private industry, which means uh, that also, by the way, the people in pharma who take a risk and succeed as a scientist, they don't have any skin in the game in the upside. But if they take skin, they fail, then they have a lot of downside. So if they're, make, if they're taking a risk and they fail, but everyone else in pharma is taking those same risks, then they don't bet. But if you take the only risk okay. and you fail, 
but the other people didn't take that risk, you'd be out of a job. That's why they behave like lemmings. That creates an opportunity for a customer. That's what I was. And I had spent seven okay. years investing in the industry, so I had this insight, you know, intimately investing in these companies. An outsider said, okay, now I'm going to solve this entrepreneur and a CEO. So my, in my entire business model was built on, the company I founded was Royvent, was built on developing drugs in areas that big pharma had abandoned. And better yet, to even get a head start, if they had done some preliminary research on it but put it on the shelf, could we find the winners, like a money ball type equation, from sure. those drugs that were languishing? Many of those drugs proved to be quite promising. Turns out five of them are FDA-approved products today. One's a wow. for prostate cancer. One is a rare genetic disease for kids, who under of whom died by the age of two without treatment. Now with treatment, a majority of those kids can live lives of a normal duration. These are remarkable facts in humanity, if I may say so myself, but we're the back yes. building a multi-billion dollar company. And so to me, that was the model that I, the 22 version, 22 year old version of myself imagined. This was the extension of that. You know, when I was a senior in, in high school, actually, uh, actually, I'm sorry, senior college, he, somebody brought up to me, you know, it was a civic minded speaker that came to Harvard's campus who said, you know, brought up JFK's famous quote, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do right. for your country. Powerful, powerful adage. But you know what I saw a lot in the country was people not even being able to help themselves. That was a great reliance that this had created on the government. And so the adage I sort of threw back to me, that's not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for yourself. And yeah. I think that that was, that, that rubbed him the wrong way a little bit. And honestly, today it rubs me the wrong way a little bit, not because I'm not proud of what I did. I mean, that's what capitalism's about, and, I, and because I am proud of it, but because I think there's more to the story than just the individual, the misconception of that rugged individualist self making it through the system of American capitalism. That's part of American identity, a fundamental pillar of it, but it's not the story either. And, and I think that, I don't know, for me, there's something about having kids. This was out years later. So I started the company, okay. led it a CEO for seven years, and toward, all the way through 2021. Uh, but in 2020, I had my first son. We have two kids now, two sons at home. Congratulations! That's I, fantastic. I have kids? Yeah. You have kids yourself? Uh, we do. We have we have four. They're all they're they're grown now. The oldest is 31, youngest 24. One will be three girls, but uh, we're blessed to have a have a wonderful family. All uh, all will be married by the end of uh, September. What? Congratulations! <laughs> Uh, oh, multiple, uh, multiple weddings in a year, maybe, or one wedding this year? Is is it one uh, wedding this year? One wedding this year. The other okay, that's good. Congratulations. Three older ones, yeah. So I, so three in nine months and on the other side of the, the upbringing process. But you'll probably sure, speak to this. You. you know, it, 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 I mean, everyone says it and it's cheesy, but it's cheesy because it's true. It just true. changes the way you see why you're doing what you do, right? And yeah. uh, that, it had the effect on me and... Um, you know, around the same time, so that so 2020, I had my first son. I also had something interesting happen in my company, which was that, you know, now we're a multi-billion dollar business, had, had success, built it from scratch, large employee base. And then Floyd Mice. And then there's these Black Lives Matter protests and riots across the country. And suddenly, we, we've done all these great things as a company. There's a man on my doorstep, even coming from many of my own employees, younger employees, to take a stand in favor of Black Lives Matter. And, you know, I always keep an open mind, but as I learned about Black Lives Matter, front page of their website, dismantling the nuclear family structure was one of their objectives. I couldn't abide that. I told you the best gift I ever got that was different than a lot of the kids that I went to school with in public schools from first to eighth grade was having a two-parent household with an emphasis on education. Why on earth would I endorse an organization? that stood against the best source of human empowerment, including black empowerment, even if it was called Black Lives Matter, refused to do it. And that, you know, that my son was born that year. I had this interesting dilemma at the company I worked at, or, you know, the company I led, a CEO that I'd founded. And, you know, all of that kind of came to a head, a lot of self-reflection that year that led to January of 2021 when I started a new journey, not focusing on prostate cancer anymore, but focusing on a cultural cancer, really, in our country that threatened to kill this American dream that allowed me to achieve everything I had. And that was that was what really was probably the first step of this new journey I've been on ever since. Wow. Wow. You, you know, I thank you for taking the time to tell us that story, because I think there's so many important things to pick up 
out of that, seeing the opportunity, making a risk, being right, as you said. But what hits me is the opportunity was there because others let it go. They didn't see it. And there are kids today that are living a normal life because you saw it and you and your team did something about it. And now look at kids who have a chance to live because of the medicines that you were able to create. And I, I want to say that because you start with your 22-year-old self trying to live the American dream for yourself, but look what you did for others that you don't even know. And there's no way you could have known. And, and I think that's duplicated in businesses and, and, and the entrepreneurial spirit around the world. When people seize an opportunity, they work they work towards something, but often it's the self's missed it or let it go you know what was it you know kodak had digital cameras and they didn't want to <laughs> right you, you know you, you, that's right you hear these stories that the people who found the invention and they put it away they wanted to hide it for whatever reason and it comes back to you know you know to kill their company in some cases uh but i i think it's really important and then and then i want to I, I keep going with your story of what you experienced that time because i think that you know 2020 covid george floyd impacted all of us. And, and there's lots of different responses of ways to go, but but for 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 you, talk about how that impacted you and how you started to look at what was happening in, in I'll stick with the US at this time, you know, in the country or in your area that set you on this new course, if you will. Because I really yeah, interested in, in why. Not not only what you're doing, but why you're doing it. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, I think that I mean, there was a lot that happened that year. So, so get into the detail of it because I think that the why came out of that, frankly. Okay. It was, so in 2020, a few things happened, right? Son was born. We have, you know, th I told you a little bit about later that year what happened with the, with the George Floyd related tragedy that gave rise to the Black Lives Matter riots across the country that, and re resulted in this politicized debate, even within my own company. But you know, he, after my son was born, it was also the COVID-19 pandemic. So he was born in February of 2020. Right. My wife's a throat surgeon, actually. And okay. she actually made an interesting decision. She had, she felt called to do it. Is, I mean, that's her specialty, the airway. She's a throat surgeon. Right. And right. he was born right into that first wave of the pandemic in New York City, where she was actually completing her training at the time. We'd moved to Ohio, but she was completing her surgery training in New York. And she just knew that colleagues needed help. I mean, that first wave of the pandemic, I don't know if you remember this, New, New York City was understaffed, hit really hard. Oh, yeah, absolutely. After giving birth, she, less than four weeks after giving birth, she she was thankfully healthy on her feet. She's very skilled at what she does. She went back to patients. And at that point, nobody knew what this virus was. And for a newborn, they said, keep, keep yourself away. And so I ended up having him. She ended up treating patients. Not surprised that she ended up getting COVID. And at that stage of the pandemic, we're talking about March of 2020, you know, everybody, especially when it came to infants, wanted to be cautious. So I spent, you know, two months actually with my son because then her father ended up getting it. Others ended up getting it. So she ended up being wrapped up in that. Well, I took two months, first two months of my son's life or months number two and three were with me back home in Ohio. And, you know, I wouldn't say that I would wish for anything bad like a, you know, disease like that to happen. But for me, for our family, it was actually, it was actually an interesting moment of self-reflection. Yeah. You know, my wife was living out her vision of her sip duty, and it made me think a lot about me doing the same. And wow. then when this politicized conflict arrives, really every company's doorstep, but mine included, then I start to think about how this culture that we've created in America, where there's this new woke movement that your identity is based on the genetic attributes you inherit on the day you're born, that we should see each other based on the color of our skin, how that was so contrary to countries that allowed both me and my wife each to live our versions of the American dream. And then we have our son and we're thinking about his generation and, and thinking about the fact that if I had even been born 20 years later, I wouldn't have been able to live the dream that I had, not in the same way, because I would have been taught to think of myself as a victim. There was something about those experiences that said, look, there's a lot of people developing medicines and it's an important job, no doubt. But there were none of them or even any elite CEOs, investors, whatever, people who had been successful on the scale that I had been, who were willing 
to even say in public the kinds of things that I was beginning to think and beginning slowly to say that businesses should not be commingled with politics, that the job of a biotech company is to develop drugs for patients who need them, not to get involved in fraught political conflicts relating to race relations in America, that we wouldn't want to adopt quota systems in hiring because that was divisive, that you should hire the very best and promote the very best regardless of the color of their skin or gen or whatever. And to me, that actually, as I looked in the mirror, was a more distinctive way to make a lasting contribution for the next generation, especially having built a company that could stand on its own two feet without me. Right. And so that's the why. Why did I step aside? It's just a question of combination of what you, sometimes it's just in that inner call. What do you feel called to do in that moment? It's not a calculation. But I think part of what called me to do it was the sense of where I could have that biggest impact I could have. And that's a question for each of us. That's not to say that that would be the right decision for every other person to then take up the same crusade that I did. But it's a, it's a sense of what do you feel called to do? What makes you feel like the truest version of yourself? Like you're actually doing something, have an impact on the country and the family that's going to live in that country, the kids who are going to live in that country. I, it's almost difficult for me to put in words, but that would probably be the best way to capture, which led me to make what was a very difficult decision at the time. But to step aside sure. as CEO of the company I'd founded to pursue right. this new mission, yeah, that was the combination of factors that led to it. Right, right. Yeah, no, I'd say uh, uh, that. Thank you again for telling that. It gives us the depth of what you're experiencing. And, you know, families change us. There's things that, you know, periods of time, as you say, we don't wish difficulty on anybody. We certainly don't wish, you know, a, a global pandemic uh, on any of us. Uh, but it's times of adversity when, when things crystallize in in life, and as you talk about in, you know, I, I'll, I'll give you a little background. You know, at Amway, had you know everything I grew up with, you know, and as I mentioned as we were talking earlier about my father's book, Believe, we believe in people, and it's always been that wherever they're from, the Amway business opportunity is open to everybody, and it was our whole life that everybody has value. And that didn't matter where they came from, what they did before. They had value. They had potential. Uh, and and that's how we saw people from the inside out. Now, you talked about, and, and I've heard you talk about the impact of Martin Luther King and this I Have a Dream speech on you. And and, and I, I think we try to live that, too, in our lives about this the content of someone's character. It's the potential right. that they have, not... Not the not a description of you know, tall, short, big, little, whatever. It, it's the it, it's you're defined by who you are inside. It's your character, it, it, and and so sync that up with this with the woke movement, if you will, with with this identity movement, and and why you feel it's so damaging. It, it relates to valuing each individual as a human being in their own right, rather than a member of a tectonic plate of group identity. So, so here's, here's the way I see it. I was thinking about this this morning, you know, in terms of how I divvy up the worldview of the woke left. And then in, mm -hmm. I think an alternative worldview that we can offer as an affirmative alternative rather than just criticizing it. The worldview of the woke left is your identity is based on attributes that you inherit on the day you're born, your race. Right your gender, and your sexual orientation. And the collective challenges that you address are challenges on a global scale, like climate change, like you know COVID-19 pandemic. I'm, I'm, I'm not criticizing them for this. I'm just giving a descriptive account for sure, what sure. left is. Your group identity, determined in part almost entirely by the genetic characteristics on you, that you inherit on the day you're born, that's what matters. And the factors that we that need to move us as human beings are shared global challenges from climate change to global equity. I, I've spent a little time, and I, many conservatives have, in criticizing what's wrong with that vision. And I could go into depth. I think it's right. divisive. I think it is something that inherently creates more division in the name of celebrating diversity. But the way I think about an alternative worldview, call it the conservative worldview, that of race, gender, sexual orientation, climate change, and equity. I think uh, valuing the individual, okay? Each individual, yeah. revive the individual. If you want group identity, we have different forms of group identity that are time-tested and true. Family is a form of group identity. 
belonging sure. to a faith-based community, I'm in faith in God. That is a source of community. The nation is a source of community. I'm a citizen of a nation rather than the global citizenship view of the modern left. Right. And so part of what moves me to, you know, viewed as anti-woke crusader, and in some ways I have been one, but part of what moves me towards it is there's, there's an alternative vision that can still fill our hunger for purpose and meaning that I think all of us, young people especially in this country, have. But the conservative movement in some ways hasn't done a good enough job of articulating what that alternative worldview is. This idea of right. ordered on simple principles. Make the stuff up. Aristotle did, okay? okay. Many thinkers <laughs> ever since St. Thomas Aquinas did. The individual, sure. the family, country, God. That's what I think we... In some ways, the conservative movement today uh, is very <laughs> prudish, if you will, right, about talking about some of those ideas. The individual we'll talk right. about, but individual, family, country, and God. I think we need to bring some of that back. It's how we raise our kids in the household. Why wouldn't we talk about it more openly as a country, too? And I think that that's right. how we dilute the woke agenda to irrelevance rather than just taking a hammer and hitting it on the head, which is kind of what I've been doing with Woke Inc. Yeah. and a lot of the other books I've written and whatnot. I'll offer you, it's not just anti that, even though you, as you go in and explore it, you, you find all the, you're, you're talking about another vision. It, yes. And I think that that's what's so important. So so now let's pivot to, you've announced yourself you're, you're, as a candidate for president and you're you're moving forward in a very public way uh, with with these things. And, and just you know, a, a, a little background, you know, my, my brother, uh, ran for governor of the state of Michigan uh, a number of years ago, uh, unsuccessful. Very difficult to put himself out there uh, in that environment. My my sister-in-law uh, just served as uh, secretary of education. Very difficult to put herself out there. You're entering into a area um, you know, of tremendous challenge, but I don't think that scares you. It doesn't talk, scare talk about it. talk about me. diving in there. How, how do you how do you look at it? I mean, the way I look how at it was it's, it. it's 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 an extension. It's probably the most difficult thing I'll, I'll I'll have done, but it's an extension of what I've spent my whole career doing. I mean, challenging big pharma's bureaucracy. That means there's good to be done by doing what the others aren't doing. That's what was my lesson as an entrepreneur. My most recent company that I founded was built on a similar insight. Strive. It's an asset management firm offering index funds and other things but doing it differently than BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard and Invesco, all sure. of whom vote their shares in corporate America to tell these companies to advance these politicized agendas. I said, no, there's an opportunity and a need to do it the other way. We'll tell companies to focus on products and services for profit without apologizing for it rather than these political agendas. So, you know, Woke Inc. was written to buck the trend and lift the curtain on a trend that no other CEO was willing to talk about. So in some ways, part of what I'm doing now is Entering the political arena, you know, it's not just entering politics. I think it's important to pursue the presidency and win it successfully to change the country. All right. It's speaking hard truths that other people aren't willing to speak, particularly in the mainstream and, and left-wing circles. But even in the conservative movement, the vacuum that I saw is what I told you is a culture of criticism, even vengeance and grievance, without offering that affirmative vision of our own, what it means to be an American today. What does it mean to be a citizen of a nation? What does it mean to have a worldview that grounds us in identities that are true? The individual, the family, the country, yes, even a believer in a higher power, a believer in God. Sure. I think that that's, that was what I saw, the equivalent of the drug that were left behind, that other bureaucratic yeah. pharma companies weren't, pers yeah. weren't, weren't pursuing. To me, these are the ordered ideas that have been left behind in our national identity, in our national culture. Then I said, somebody needs to pick those up and run with them. And yes, is there an opportunity to win the presidency? Fine. And I don't fetish, I don't fetishize that position. It's not something I've coveted. But it's an opportunity that somebody needs to pursue for the sake of that country. I thought it was. And that's what called me into this presidential race. And I only decided, my wife and I decided together in December. It's very recent. But we're from a cloth where once we've decided we're going to do something, it's hard to shake off. We're not going to dither around. We're going to step up and do it. By the end of February, we had declared and, and we're in the presidential race. Okay. Reminds you of your wife decided to go to uh, New York at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, you make a decision, you go for it. You have a determination and, and you stand up for what you believe in. And and talk about that a little bit more. So, you know, 
those things that that are going to shape it, you know e- even before the policies and what you do in a, in a political set but it's that belief system it, to me as as I followed you it, it's your belief system that's going to that defines your purpose and, and brings people together. As you talk about our national motto, right? E plus unum, if we all come together, but people from vast diversities can come together around a, a common cause. And so talk a little bit about how you see your ability or your message bringing people together and what in a campaign is very divisive. It's one person against another person. It's, you know, you, this, these sorts of things. And, and everyone, and the whole environment is trying to create that. It's trying to create that divisiveness. But yet your, your message to me feels like you're, you're trying to bring people together. Help, help us uh, understand that better from your perspective. I mean, I would say that national unity, Doug, is my top priority. I think we're on our way towards a national divorce. I'd be careful not to even use that word too much. It speaks itself into existence. Right. But I think we can get off. We don't have to be on that train. We can hit a switch track and find our way to a national revival. And I think the way we get to national unity, and this is counterintuitive for some people, isn't, in my opinion at least, by showing up in the so-called middle and compromising right. to say, can't we all get along? Right. It's a tempting view, but that's not going to happen. If that was going to happen, it would have happened already. Right. I think the right way we achieve national unity is by embracing the principles, the ideals that set this nation into motion 250 years ago. The radicalism of those ideals, and let's be really honest, the American ideals are radical ideals, free speech, open debate, self-governance over aristocracy, the idea that mere citizens can be trusted to determine the answers to complex claims in a political process through the rule of law. These are radical ideas. For most of human history, it was done the other way. Certainly old world yeah. Europe, before 1776, it was done the other way. So these are radical ideals, but I think the way we achieve true national unity is by reviving those radical ideals and embracing them and say, that's what makes America great. That is what makes America itself. That is what makes us, us, it's who we are. We're bound by that common set of ideals, more than just the genetic attributes we inherit on the day we're born, more than our, you know, you and I have two different shades of melanin, Doug. Great. I'm, that's why maybe I asked if you could see me at the beginning. I can see you too. That's great. We look yeah. a little different. So what? Unless right. there's something greater that binds us together across that diversity. And with that, then our diversity can be a beautiful thing. But part of what happened in the environment that I grew up to, grew up into, I'm 37 years old. I was born in 1985. The environment that I grew up into, especially over the last 10, 20 years in this country, was one where we separated our diversity so much that we forgot all the ways we're really just the same as one people bound by those ideals. And I still think those ideals exist in this country. We just need to rediscover them. And that's what this campaign, it's less of even a political campaign, it's a cultural campaign to revive right. those common ideals. And I think we can do it. I'm an optimist about that, but we're going to have to see the problem with clear eyes first, that my books and everything else are about. We've done enough of that now. Right. Now it's time to actually revive the solution on the other side of it. And I think we can do it. Yeah. Well, I, I, we, we have to do it right. It, you know, uh, it, it's a, a, a journey. It's a, it's a journey, but it's also a journey that e- each one of us can do in our own lives, in our own place of work, in our own, you know, in our own families, you know, to, to stand up for those things that we believe in and live them out. Talk about the strength to do that in the midst of cancel culture. As you said, some of these things people get squeamish about talking about, about their faith, about uh, about their belief system, about, you know, even, you know, even political positions. You know, we, you know, I, I have a lot of sensitivity for that part in the middle. Jerry Ford comes from Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's my home. President Ford always said, we can disagree without being disagreeable. Um, and and so so I can see the feeling of that, that may seem like it brings you into the middle, but but President Ford, from everything I remember, and and I always felt so blessed to have known him, he had strong beliefs, and and he didn't waver from those, even you know, even if it may have seemed like he tried to bring things together. But his role as a in the country 
was to bring us together, uh, as many people say, after the Great Division since the Civil War. Uh, you know, and, and so your your view of bringing people together, but finding it with strong beliefs that that the world that recognize and how 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 can we stand up to those? Talk about how we can stand up to those uh, the, the the cancel culture uh, that we're we're dealing with. There's this cultural fear in our country, right? The culture of fear, I think, has been infectious in American life, right? It's it's a culture that you know makes people make a choice in this country between yeah. putting food on the dinner table and speaking their minds freely as people even begin to yeah. lose their job for saying the wrong thing on their own time, right. for posting the wrong thing on sure. their social media account, for wearing the hat of the wrong presidential candidate to work. And to me, that's not America. America is a country right. where you get to speak your mind freely without fear of putting food on the dinner table. The American dream and the First Amendment, you get to enjoy both of those things at once. That's part of what the new American dream to me is all about. But if, right. if you want if you want a you know, good litmus test. I sometimes share this with younger audiences. Of, I spoke to Ohio State, actually. Uh, you know, I know you guys have Michigan roots, so no offense there. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay. Well, it's okay. We'll let it go. Well, disagree without being disagreeable here. Uh, <laughs> I, I spoke to uh, an Ohio State audience last night of kids. I mean, or kids. I mean, college students. And you know what I said is, look, if you want a litmus test of how well we're doing as a country, here's the litmus test for you. What is the gap between what people are willing to say in private and what they'll say in public? When that gap is small, we're doing great as a country. When that gap is large, we're doing poorly. Right now, I can't remember a time in my life where there was a bigger gap between what people were willing to say in private and what people were willing to say in public. We have to fix that. I think if we fix that, what we discover, into our earlier strand on national unity, I think what we'll discover is that actually more of us share those common ideals than we know. I mean, I think that, I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican or black or white, if you ask people in this country, do you believe in ideas like meritocracy and free speech and self-governance, and rule of law? I think most of us agree on these ideals. I think most of us think that our neighbors and our classmates and our colleagues at work do too, but we don't feel sure about that anymore because we're not free to talk about it. So, so that's why I think that, you know, fear has been infectious, like I said, but courage can be right. contagious, too. It's actually one of the slogans of our yeah. campaign. Courage is contagious, but not in some not like easy politician-y kind of way. Just, just true. It just requires yeah. more of us to exhibit it. And so one of the things I ask people to do, maybe even people who are listening to this, try this. Okay, just, just an easy trick to try. It's almost like a promise I can make you, actually. Just try this on your own time when you're, when you're the only person in the room who believes what you do. Classroom a parent-teacher conference, a board meeting, a nonprofit committee meeting, whatever it is. You're the only person in the room who believes what you do. Try standing up and saying it without apology, without hedging, respectfully, right? You're not without being disagreeable, but part of respect sure. means not compromising or softening it around the edges. Say exactly what you mean. And my commitment to you right now is that all, every one of those times you will find out that you were not the only person in the room who believed what you did. That's what it means for courage to be contagious. And, and I just think we live in one of those moments where we can do it. We just have to start talking openly again. I figured there's no better way to do it than to do it by leading. That's what I'm doing. But that's what this whole campaign is about, is a campaign to make that courage part of our contagious culture rather than fear, which is which has owned the show so far. And so, yeah, yeah it's it's been so good talking to you about this. Time's flown right by, yeah. but, but yeah. know, I think... This is this is what we need to do more of, Doug, and I'm glad we're we're doing it now. Well, well, Vivek, as you talked about the courage being contagious and the courage to stand up for what you believe in, you are standing up for what you believe in. You're helping us do the same and and challenging us to vocalize it. So and I know we have to wrap up here, and I'm just so grateful for the time that we've had. Any last thoughts that you would want to share? Uh, you know, and talk about that 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 uh, kind of make sure we send us off on. Uh, on the right track with being yeah. uh, being yeah. courageous. So, yeah, I think courageous and optimistic. I think optimism is part of courage because you have yeah. to have a reason to be courageous. And I thought false optimism, it's true optimism. Where I don't think yeah. we have to believe the bipartisan consensus in this country right now that we're in a national decline. I don't right. think you have to accept that. I don't think we have to be Rome. I don't think we have to be Carthage. I think if you think about it this way with me for a second in closing here, it meant that we're just a little young as a country, going through our version of adolescence, figuring out who we're going to be when we grow up, 
right? You're lost in adolescence. That's okay. It's part of what it means to go through adolescence, to mature a little bit. Maybe that's where we are. I think that's where we are. And I believe that if we view it that way, I think our best days, our adulthood is still ahead of us. And, you know, I think for me, at least personally, when I view it that way, take some of the pressure off and, and brings back some of the conviction in terms of where we're heading. And I just think it, it happens to be true. And that's the way I'm going to not only run for president, but govern if we lead this country. And you know, I'm grateful to anybody who wants to put us in a position to do that. And you know, Vivek 2024 com. There's a lot more on these cultural ideas there. Check it out, and hopefully, we'll continue to have more of these conversations too. Yeah, I appreciate it. Vivek, thank you so much for your your time. Thank you for your optimism. Thank you for your courage. Uh, and, and we continue to uh, we'll continue to follow you and cheer for you every step of the way. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Yeah.